Hello friends. We are in the middle English period uh, and we have seen simplification of English grammar. First we saw the noun, second adjective, third we saw the pronouns and today we will see the verb. What was the situation of the verb and how the verb and its forms along with idiom and usage how these things were simplified during the Middle English period as English stood on the threshold of the modern English period. Understand? Now, as you can see, in in Middle English period, scarcely there were any progressive. Progressive, you know, is going, I'm going, are going. So what? they used to do was, they used the simple tense. What is the difference between simple tense and uh, other tenses? Say for example, simple present and simple past. Why do you say simple past? Is it because it is uh, very simple in, in its dress or uh, in eating habit and so on? No. Simple means no aspect. The others have aspect, for example, progressive and perfective. Understand? Future. There is an aspect. So, a tense with an aspect is not sim simple. Tense without aspect, they are simple. For example, simple present, no aspect. Simple past, also no aspect. Aspect means either progressive or perfective or future. That is it. Minus this, this uh, the tenses are simple. Or we can say another exam, another way to find out the symbol is that it's a one word tense. Simple person is a one word tense. Sometimes we tell the students that they are bachelor tenses. There are two bachelor tenses in English. One is simple person and the other is simple uh, past. All the other uh, others are married tenses. <laughs> That's it. They are cluster, you know. Has been going, is going, was going. Has gone, so that way. Now that is simple means. Okay, progressive is that. So in Shakespeare, you find we give take take examples from Shakespeare. So Polonius asks asks Hamlet, you know, what do you read, my lord? See that? Oh, oh, in fact, what happens is that there should be he should have asked, him, what are you reading, my lord? So what are you reading? So what do you read, my lord? So simple terms. But what happened is that, and now we can see, say, end of 17th century, beginning of 18th century, you are using, or there is an increase in the use of simple, uh, progressive terms. So that is first, first point that you have to see, which uh, progress, progress scarcity of Scarcity of progressive tenses. Scarcity of the progressive. Sorry. Scarcity of the progressive. So instead they use the same. That's point one. An example I have already given you, very famous example. So I need not write. What do you read, my lord? What is the answer? Words, words, words. That's the answer. And then compound participles. participles were well, infrequent, compound participles. There's another. Say, for example, having spoken thus. Having spoken thus. Having spoken is a compound participle. Simple participle will be spoken. First participle is spoken. But uh, compound participle is having spoken thus. So that's the second point. Infrequency of, infrequency of compound participles. Compound participles. The an example here is having having spoken thus. If it is only spoken, then it is simple. Well, two words having spoken. Understand? So you can uh, other example having decided to make the items. Having decided, this is all taken from Shakespeare. Having decided, 
Harving decided to make the atoms. The atoms. If it is only decided, then it is first person. Or if it is only ing form, say, eating. He is eating. So eating is possible. So there you can say. But if it is a in this way, one more word with that, then it is a combo person. So these were very really again scarce you can say or infrequent. But modern English you find them plenty. So uh, like uh, uh, you you say like this, no? Uh, this having been seen by him, I hit myself. Having been that is passive. Having been seen by him, I hit myself. That is also compound uh, compound parts. And then another feature of Middle English verb and verbal usage is. Use of impersonal instead of personal. See, for example, you say, example, you say, it dislikes me. It dislikes me, so please him. So please him. It dislikes me. So what is the third point? Use of impersonal. Impersonal. It dislikes me. It dislikes me. See, what a person will be? Personal, personal use of this will be I, I, and the whole thing here to say, it dislikes me to, uh, we can say, so please him. It dislikes me, so please him. So today you will say, I dislike to please him. I dislike to please him. So that is personal use. It dislikes me, so please. And you have it even today, it rains, for example. I rain, you cannot say. It rains, isn't it? It's time and so on. That is very rare, no? But almost all the time what we do is we are using personal. Personal. So, yes. So three points. Scarcity of progressive, infrequency of compound participle. Now this is use of impersonal verbs rather than personal. That is, these are examples. And the fourth one is about the uh, difference in ending of third person singular indicative. You know, third person singular. He, she, it. All the things that are not first and second persons are third person. My book third person, three third person. You know it without my degree. So the third person singular is yes. Today, so that is the fourth point. Third person, third person singular indicative, indicative statements in statements, in the indicative mode. For example, we say goes, he goes, he goes, but they go. In Middle English period, you have got the yet as the ending, yet. You will find in Shakespeare, you will find in the Bible, translations of the Bible. Telleth, giveth, goeth. So this, hath, doth. Telleth, giveth. Hath, hath means has. Doth means does. Most of these disappeared, but for a long time, hath and doth remain. This is in the southern and southeastern part of England. That is London, for example. But northern dialects, they use the S. In the north, it was S. You remember, no? Dialects of Middle English. East Midland, West Midland, Northern and Southern. So in that case, what happens is, this common, but in north, it was S. So after Sunday, what happened? S became common. In several cases, you could do, you could use both. This yet, yet, yet ending, you can see Shakespeare uses in 
I speech on mercy, no? He says, no. What does he say? Remember, no? the quality of mercy is not strained. Next line is, it droppeth as a gentle rain from heaven. Droppeth. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as a droppeth. No? It droppeth as a droppeth. It droppeth. As a gentle rain, this it droppeth as a gentle rain from heaven. And then he says, upon the place beneath it is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. Blesseth. So Shakespeare uses that. Blesseth. Droppeth and blesseth. This is a land very famous. I need not write it on the board, I think. The quality of mercy is not strange. The quality of mercy is not strained. And then, and uh, says it, it, it droppeth as a gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath it. It is toys blessed. It is toys blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. So you can see in Shakespeare uses this. That does. Then in North it does this. So what happened is that, you know, uh, uh, you find uh, this, because it is easy now, language always goes for easy expressions, that you can see. Love, like this, beautiful, But in the trial scene, the trial scene you will find it, uh, yes. Third person is yes, but rather than yet. Trial scene of the merchant of Venice. Trial scene of the merchant of Venice. Where, where you have got two yes forms, there is one at the form. That's how it is. Understand? Sometimes what happens, you know, the plural of third person also uh, carried this yes. See, troubled minds that wakes. Troubled minds. Troubled minds. Plural that wakes. So that is a swam here. So in plural also something they used to do. Her dealings teach us. Teaches us. Hard dealings. Hard dealings. Teaches us. So <laughs> very often it was used like this. But finally what happened is, by the 17th and 18th century, you can say, it was fixed because of the work of Dr. Johnson, Swift and Defoe and so on, Daniel Defoe and so on. Yes. And then a fifth point is, it's all about verb simplification. Verb, so yet disappeared and then S came on. And the sixth point is strong and big verbs. You remember no? strong and big verbs. Strong and weak verbs. The number of strong verbs was reduced and the number of weak verbs increased. A strong verb means a verb that makes its other tenses by vowel chain. Sing, sang, sung. That is short, strong verb. Weak verb means a verb, a verb that makes its past tense by adding ed. That is love, loved, love. See that the, you have got, you have got, you know, see, there are many uh, strong verbs in Old English like crowd, flame, mow, crowd, flame, mow, dread, sprout, crowd, flame, mow, crowd, sprout, dread, this, this way. Strong verbs, but now when you come to 16th century end, they became weak. That's why we have got crowded, flayed, mowed, sprouted, and dreaded. Or sometimes sprout. sprouted. Sprouted, I think that is uh, more common. Still, there were some uh, strong verbs. So there are wax, for example. Wax. Wax. So. See? And the Passions of waxen, waxen, C 
sue the sue the other persons. Uh, help, help, plus hold. And now these forms disappear. They begin uh, uh, weak verbs, maxed, sold, and help. See this. So reduction in the number of uh, strong verbs. Understand that's and I come the next point. You say that idiom. It's especially with the prepositions. Prepositions. So you say that idiom. Usage and idioms. That is the sixth point. It's only the sixth point. About verbs and about English. Usage and idioms. And then, then you find it, you know, see that the articles, for example, use of articles. In Shakespeare, you find creeping like snail. First is articles. Articles. Creeping like snail. So an article is missing here, no? but it has idiomatic usage. Creeping like a, what is missing here is a, a snake. It has big gas, hard as thou. So here what is missing is a, with, with as big, hard as thou. So the missing is with as big a hat. So this as big a hat. That is missing. A. That is, it's not a mistake. It's a, for example, you have today now this. If you go to the, you go to the hospital and go to hospital. What is the difference? When you go to the hospital, you are going to the building. When you go to hospital, you are going for the purpose. Treatment. Like that. That is idiomatic use. What is the meaning? Idiom. Standing out. You cannot explain it by rules of grammar. That is what is meant by idiom. All the idioms are like kick the buckets. It is an idiom. But if you say kick the buckets, and I remember a student wrote in the examination in the paper, the answer script. A, the old man got angry in the bathroom and kicked the bucket. So that <laughs> kicked the bucket means to die. What the student meant is he got angry and then kicked the bucket because there is no water. Something like that. So we cannot. <laughs> in number of our friends, another, another, another expression. In number of number of our friends. These are from Shakespeare. So what is the uh, missing? What is the missing article? In the. So you can say the missing article is in the. In the number of our friends. But consider it to be, but it is considered to be what? Idiomatic use. That's the thing. Shakespeare is idiomatic use. Understand? And now you have got a preposition. Use of prepositions, that is the second point to note. Second. First is article, then prepositions. Preposition. In prepositions, what you find is uh, we say uh, at length, at last, Shakespeare would say, uh, at, at the Yes. At the length, yes. Shakespeare uses. At the last. This is Shakespeare's use. But now we know we don't use this. At last and the at length. Difference between modern and the use. So then, then you have got the placing of negative. Another point. Placing of negative three. Placing of negative. 
of the negative. Uh, Shakespeare will say, and uh, the point will be like this now. Say, uh, I not doubt. I, I not doubt. I not doubt. See? I don't. I doubt. I don't doubt. We will say today. It not appears to me. It not appears to me. It does not appear to me. Modern English. We say. She not denies it. She not denies it. She not denies it. She does not deny it. See the question. And then the fourth one is very interesting because it is uh, as the historians of the English language say it is a great gloss to English. And you know what is it? The use of double negative. The use of double negative. Shakespeare uses now. Uh, that is point number Four or five, the use of a fourth, fourth, a use of double negative. This is one way of emphasizing. But later, the Americans taking the a clue from logic. They said, if there are two negatives, it is positive. But actually, these two negatives or three negatives were used for emphasizing a point. Thou hast spoken no word all this while, Shakespeare. Thou hast, thou hast spoken no word all this while. Already you see there is a negative. Thou hast, thou hast spoken no word all this while, nor understood none neither. Aha. Uh -huh. Nor understood none neither uh, how many negatives see that so later grammarians you know they applied principles of logic then they said this is nonsense <laughs> so they said there is they said it is <coughs> it goes against logic and therefore applying the principles of logic you cannot use double negatives like this but this one, I know not, nor I greatly care not. Another example. I know not, I know not, nor I greatly care not. Care not. See, no, no, no. How many notes? Negatives. No? This is. This. So we are double negatives like. And a fifth point is, I hope you are following me. A fifth point, the examples all taken from Shakespeare. And because Shakespeare is standing at the, on the threshold of modern English and at the same day, end of middle English. So changes that took place you now. Shakespeare as Janus faced. January, you know, Janus, the Roman goddess, looks back and also is backward and forward. That is Janus face. So it's you can say like that. And if there's a uh, proposition you can see like this, no? Uh, you have seen it. Our fears in Bango stick be. Our fears in Bango stick be. So our fears in Bangu, what should be the current proposition as today? Our fears about. So instead of about, he uses in. That is the use of our way. In cinematic use, no? He came off an errand to me. He came off an errand to me. He came off and Errand to me. So what is the 
He, what is the proposition? What to be? What proposition? He came on. Listen this. On an errand. This is a word. On an errand to me. Instead of, this is off. Off is used for many propositions. You know. I will give another example. It was well done of you. Another example. It was it was well done of you. It ought to have been by you. See, of is used for on, of is used for by, like you. I wonder of their being together. I wonder of another one. I wonder of I wonder of their being together. What is the proposition instead of this? I wonder at. See that? I wonder at, not of. I wonder at. You are following me, I think. You provided of a torch bearer. Another one. You provided of a torch bearer. You provided of a torch bearer. So what is the proposition? You provided of that is with. So then, the proposition missing is oh sorry, instead of of you should have used with. with. So you can see, this one proposition of in Shakespeare manages to do the work of on, by, at, with. That is, uh, from Middle English to Modern English. That did not show thee of a fool, another one. That did not show thee, that did not show the, see yesterday we had this, this, no? that did not show the of a fool. So of is here, of is here used for as. That did not show the as a fool. Did you get that way? That is, that is the thing. I have no mind of feasting forth tonight. Hello. I have no mind of, I have no mind of feasting forth tonight. So what is it? I have no mind of, what is the proposition that we will use? I have no mind for. So you can see a single proposition of used for how many? One, two, three, four, five, six. That's it. That's what Shakespeare. So these were some of the what we can say the idiomatic usage or the usage in those days by great writers like Shakespeare. Uh, the, these are examples for how verbs. Idiom, usage and idiom, of course, is connected with the verbs. So how these uh, verbs and uh, related things, verbal expressions, were used during those days. And now, when you come to 18th century, you will find that these anomalies were corrected and the language was fixed by great geniuses like uh, Dr. Johnson. So these are the uh, points that we have to Consider when you think about the verb. So if you say like this, what we have seen today, quickly we'll have a review, a quick review. That is, we have six points all together. What are the six points? First one is uh, scarcity of progressive. Instead of that, you use the simple terms. What you read, my Lord, etc. Then compound participles were very, very, very infrequent. Compound participles meaning having been, etc. Then there was impersonal use of the verb, number of them. I, 
as we have as we have seen today also we have it today it dislikes me it dislikes me not to double negative it dislikes me not except then there is a difference in third person declension yet in south and southeast that is replaced by north and s also there were some for some time both shakespeare you find both in uh, quality of mercy you find at the form and the trial scene you find s form so this there are strong and big verbs most important thing about strong and big verbs is that uh, mean strong verbs became big verbs example you have got crowd sprout dread and mow and so on. then we have we also saw that uh, some weak strong verbs they they had they were uh, they strong with uh, so wax wax and so on. help hold now that they become help and finally we see idioms idiomatic use we can say like that idiomatic use that is article a article definite article the your prepositions so also or again there is another one that is uh, goes he goes the king tonight goes he tonight back home they used to ask like that. goes goes the king back lennox asks in the in macbeth no goes the king today we don't do like that we say does the king go do you do you ask today like this uh, go you outside today no you go outside uh, don't you go outside you say like that don't you go outside. so this is another we can say as number 7 you can add this that is auxiliaries were not used for asking questions so i can add this also number 7 auxiliaries uh, auxiliary questions auxiliary uh, questions without auxiliary without auxiliary see example is there goes the king back tonight to his palace to his palace goes the king back tonight to his palace the instructor is saying does the king go so that the seventh point i think it is clear to you so first about scarcity progressive second compound participles third invasion use for the different declensions of the verb and fifth strong and weak and sixth you have got use and idiom and seventh you have got the, the use of uh, questions without auxiliaries questions without auxiliaries in the bible there is a famous sentence no? that is uh, he came to his son his son received him not that is placing of not and double negative yes placing him not and double negative that is i think it is clear to you So in that way there are eight points, isn't it? Scarcity of progressive, compound participles two, impersonal use three, difference declension of verbs four, strong and weak of five, uh, then double negative. But double negative comes in the what what we call a preposition double negative. So that need not be separated. That is we can say it is about uh, it is idiomatic use double negative. So seven instead of increasing the number if we put it as 7 right 7 is a perfect number it's a good one also. so i hope that you have been following my lectures and uh, you are profiting and is benefiting out of this and then with this optimistic note uh, for the time being i will wind up tomorrow or the next class i will again appear before you with another topic that is continuation of this the next one is of course appeal to authority the so all those 18th century 18th century mo 18th century mo 18th century moment you know three great persons dryden pope and dr johnson age of dryden we said age of dr johnson we said the early part of 18th century age age of dr so age of dryden then latter part is age of dr johnson and dr johnson is 
He is credited with that greatest achievement that is a dictionary of the English language. That is the first ever comprehensive dictionary or lexicon. Yes. The greatest of the lexicographers of the English language. Yes. 1755. Single handed. Now you have got editation all over the world with computer and all this. It was single handed with no computer. He completed this. And so he is considered as the father of English lexicography. So we will see these things. Difference between standard English and standardizing English. Standard English means generally accepted English. Standardizing means fixed. That means you correct all the faults and then fix it. That is standardized means. So these things we will see in our next classes. So till then, till we meet again. Bye. Have a nice day. Enjoy yourself.